much. Now, that already brings us at the end for the solution sessions on energy systems, but we are transitioning right away into the solution sessions for the built environment. And to do that, we have a short video clip that we will be showing. Let's work together is what it said. Thank you. Yeah, we, we can do a round of applause for that. OK, so this session will focus on the built environment. To all those just walking in, hello and welcome. We're doing spotlight solution sessions here. And this next one will focus more on the roles of cities. Because we know eh, that cities, in particular, construction practices, they rely heavily on energy intensive materials, for example, like steel and cement. I think we all know that. And at the same time, we see that they contribute that they contribute significantly to carbon emissions overall. Now, before we hop into the session and the speakers, I think you've been listening for a little bit now. I think you have. So I actually wanted to, uh, to do a little exercise with everyone in the room here, because I'm a little curious to hear from you if you know how much of the global carbon emissions that we have are caused and emitted by cities. So. If everybody can stand up, we'll do a little exercise. Please stand. Just stretch those legs, raise your knees. Yes, also the people in the back, please stand up, everyone. OK, there you go. OK, now that you're all standing, in a little bit, I will mention a number, which is a percentage. And if the number I mention is too high, if you think, no, this is way too much, it's not that large of a chunk of the emissions, you may sit down again. And then we'll see how many people we have seated at the end. So I'm starting. Just to check up how, how up to date you are on the impact of our cities on global carbon emissions. Who thinks that all of our global, for our global annual carbon emissions, that for cities alone, that they are responsible for 40%? If you think that, that it's more than 40, you remain standing. Nobody sat down. OK. Who thinks it's more than 50%, then you, uh, you still remain seated? Somebody sat down. Or you're just tired. You're like, ah, got to sit down now. Who thinks that our cities are responsible for more than 60% then remain standing. Ooh, more people sitting down in the back. It's becoming tempting now. Who thinks it's more than 70% then remain standing? Oh, oh, and then the only people that are still standing are the people that prepared this brief. Can we have a big round of applause for everyone in here? Because, uh, well, 
I mean an applause for your sharpness. Thank you for participating. But I don't think it's, uh, I think that's a number we can get down. The International Energy Agency calculated that it's more than 70% of our global annual carbon emissions that come from cities alone. So that is something to put into perspective, especially when we consider the amount of people that will be living in cities by 2050. I think the UN projection is 68% of the global population. Um, so that is a quite an impact that we need to mitigate. Um, and that is what this session will focus on. So how can we embrace low carbon construction materials, ways to build our cities and operate in that? And as always, we start with the keynote speaker. So it is my honor to introduce to the stage um, the very next person. She is the director at the UK Industrial Decarbonization Research and Innovation Center. Please give it up for Mercedes Maroto Baler. Big round of applause for her, please. Thank you so much, Mercedes. Welcome. Uh, I'll say the lectern and the stage is all yours, and then I'll be back with you in a bit. Perfect. Thank okay, thank you. Um, I hope you can, yes, you can hear me. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for staying here. Uh, and I guess, uh, you know, a fabulous job introducing my presentation and why we want them to stay here and find out more. Um, so if I move, there it goes. Um, so what I want to um, talk for a few minutes uh, today is actually how everything is actually connected together. We just heard about the cities and, and big, big cities growing even more. But I think the role of industrial decarbonization in terms of uh, getting these cities to net zero and low carbon is particularly critical. So actually, this slide has been already covered. Um, probably the, the point, though, that maybe I do want to reflect on this slide is over 70 percentage, as it was said, of the CO2 emissions come from cities. Um, that was already said. But I think it's really on the right-hand side. 80 percentage also of our global GDP comes from cities. And I think that's also we have to consider. As cities grow, we need more cement, more steel, more concrete. We need more hydrogen. Maybe that's going to be the way to warm, to warm up and heat our cities and our houses. But where all this is going to be coming from is not from the cities themselves. This is going to be coming from industries. So for the cities to actually decarbonize, it is critical that we decarbonize the built environment. And that's really the point at the end there. The journey to net zero. It's not a journey that we are going to be doing alone. This is a journey that is going to take our cities, it's going to take our industries, our clusters, our regions. And we need to do it all together, because really nobody can be left behind. So with this in mind, um, the UK actually published in March 2021 the first industrial decarbonization strategy worldwide. There have been a few other ones coming afterwards, uh, but we can say confidently that we put the first one. And if you look at that, like any roadmap, like any strategy, it starts today and has an end point. The end point for us is that we will decarbonize our industry, but quite critically, by 2040, we will have the first world net zero industrial cluster. And by 2030s, we will have four low carbon industrial clusters. And the journey that, oops, if I can go back, um, there it goes. The journey therefore starts in clusters. So what is a cluster, you may be wondering. So a cluster is a combination of different industries that they happen to be co-located within a region. And the size of that region may vary, but what is important is that they share infrastructure, they share skills, and they actually also share some of the technologies that we have to develop and deploy at much larger scale. So by anchoring projects into these clusters, what we are doing is we are stimulating the journey to low carbon and net zero. And in the case of the UK, uh, this came a mandate through the Industrial Decarbonization Challenge, the opportunity here. And as you can see, for the UK, actually, industry is not too big. It's only 9% of our GDP. You go to many other countries, particularly in Asia, and you will see that number much, much bigger. But that's the number for us, 9% of our UK GDP, and we're really keen to keep and grow that GDP of industries. That means we have 2.6 million direct jobs, and the flip of the coin, as it happens, is 16% of our UK emissions. 
Now, if you look at the industry in the UK, what happens is about 50 percent, it's a bit more than that, of all the industrial emissions come from clusters. So in other words, by just going after these clusters, help them in their journey to net zero, we are taking care of over 50 percentage of all our industrial emissions. And that's quite a large number. We probably, depending on how you count it, but you are looking at 40 to 50 million tons per year. And when we talk about industries, the other point to, to really remark here is that these industries are everything from cement, steel, glass, are really the heavy, intensive energy industries. And unfortunately, also the ones that are very hard to decarbonize. They're really challenging. Not impossible, but challenging. And if you look in the case of the UK, where they are, you can see the map there. So they start all the way from Grangemouth. They go through the Teesside, the Humber, the Southampton area, and then moving up to the West Coast, we have the Wells, South Wales area, and then the Merseyside, Liverpool, Manchester area. So we basically have a really good coverage of all the UK. And for those of you familiar with these regions, you will know that those regions, in many cases, they are actually in rather disadvantaged areas. So we want to make sure that we keep the jobs we grow these areas economically. This is not about outsourcing our industry. And the other point as well that you can see is, you may not see all the different colors from the back, but the fact that they are so colorful, all those different areas, are telling us that there is a variety of different industries. So in other words, by helping these seven clusters, we help a large, large number of sectors to decarbonize. And also because of that, there is a large number of different industries and technologies that we are developing. The whole program, as you have on the left hand side, on the right hand side, uh, is in the order of a half a billion pounds. It's basically matched 50-50 between industry and um, private or third parties and government. And one of the points as well to, to make is that the way the program is designed is actually has three very critical elements that run in parallel. There is a program of deployment, so actually we are deploying projects. There is an element where it's actually cluster plans, how these clusters are going to be reaching net zero. And then very critically as well, there is the Industrial Decarbonization Research and Innovation Center. That's the center I'm directing, and for short, we call it IDRIC. And it's the beauty of these three elements together that doesn't happen very often, that actually help us to accelerate the transition. It helps us to share knowledge. It helps us really to move at much higher pace and scale. And these are different projects, different industries that we are dealing with. Um, if I just kind of get into this as one of my last slides, if you look here, this is about realizing the green industrial futures. And this is about attracting investment. And if you look, the way we do it is through policy and engagement. It's really important. It's through research and innovation, understanding there is a wide range of solutions coming together. But also very important as well, we need to make sure we nurture talent, we nurture leadership, because the energy transition fundamentally is going to be underpinned by a skill transition. And then finally, it needs to be this knowledge exchange. So I'm just going to close here. This is not something that just happens in the UK. There is globally, we have this across many other regions. And I invite you to actually come to COP28, where we'll be running a knowledge exchange across how different clusters work worldwide. And they are coming more and more. And I think that's the end. I'm just going to stop there. These are sort of messages for people to take on board about how important it is we do it together. We need to do a holistic approach. And this is also about opportunities going forward. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mercedes. Um, I am looking in the room. Is there any question for Mercedes right away on the basis of this? Anybody? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Or you're just giving me the day of my life because I get to ask all my questions. Because I actually did have a few. Um, you showed us the clustering, and I think it's, it's most, you've done it in the UK, and it's formidable <laughs> to see. What do you think is the potentiality of scaling this up to other countries? Perhaps there are people in the room here and they're listening and they think, well, that might be interesting for my country to take up or I would like to bring that back home after today. Do you, yeah. do you foresee pot potentiality there? 
Yes, and, and, and that's one of the areas that we are working very actively now. And we start with a workshop we did earlier on this year in, in London, and we are going to do another one in, in COP yeah. in, in Dubai. And it's really about how we can take some of these lessons about these clusters emerging, not just in the UK or the global north, they're actually right. emerging in the global south. Yeah. And how we can make sure that we exchange knowledge and lessons, uh, because at the end of the day, it's not just the clusters in the UK, we need every single cluster hub yeah. and industrial decarbonization to happen. Yeah, absolutely. I like that. Hey, and you mentioned COP a couple of times. If you would say, if you would have to mention like one most urging and pressing thing that has, has to happen in the upcoming year, and it could be something that you want to do, but it can also be something that you identify that we as a global community should focus on, what would that be? Uh, I think it's maybe the thinking that we should change about industrial decarbonization is difficult, mm. but it's also critical and it's possible. Yeah. And, and I don't think we should be looking at this area that is so difficult that we are going to live for the end. This is an area we need to start getting work a lot more on this together, and UNIDO is doing a fantastic job on yeah. this, and, and the council for the engineers for the engineer and energy transition. Yeah. But it's really that realization we can do that, uh, yeah. but it's challenging. No, but I think it's good that we that we acknowledge that because then we can sort of have a good starting ground all together. Everyone, once more, can I have a big round of applause for Mercedes? Thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, moving on. Our next speaker is an online joining speaker. So let's see if we can get a hold of him because this is somebody who can really speak uh, to the industry perspective when it comes to driving change. So we're very happy to have him joining us online. Let's welcome the Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Officer at SSAB Steel, Martin Pei. Let's see if we can get him up in the back. And there he is, Martin, I will say the floor is all yours and take it away. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to join in this session. I hope you can hear me. Yes, yes, we can. Very good. Um, should I share? Yeah, very good. Thank you for uh, um, having the opportunity to talk about SSAB's transformation for the steel industry. Next slide, please. Yes, as we all have heard so much, steel is an extremely important material. It is uh, uh, essentially the most important construction material for all our cities, but also for producing electricity, producing food, drinking water, all the communication and housing infrastructure. However, steel is also an industry that stands for around 7% of global CO2 emissions. So the steel industry needs to find urgently a technology to develop these solution so that we can produce steel from iron ore without these emissions. And that is what we have done a lot uh, in the steel industry and especially at SSAB, we have developed a new technology that I'm going to share. Next slide, please. Uh, in 2016, we initiated a joint research program uh, led by SSAB, the steel company based in Stockholm, Sweden, with operations in Finland and, and US, uh, together with the mining company LKB and energy company Vattenfall. Uh, we uh, initiated this research program and very soon we decided to create a joint venture company called Hybrid Development AB. Uh, we have invested heavily in a research program, investing in a pilot research uh, facility. As you see here in 2020, we uh, commissioned this uh, research facility. And in 2021, we managed to produce the world's first foresight for steel. I will explain in the next slides what, how that has been done. And now we uh, had delivered this first uh, steel to our customer, Volvo Group, who has produced this uh, uh, beautiful vehicle that was delivered to their customer, NCC, one of the largest construction companies uh, in Sweden during summer 2022. So now we have shown that this technology works and it actually can uh, solve one of the major challenges the whole industry is facing. Next slide, please. What we have done essentially is that uh, 
um, we have developed a new technology using fossil free hydrogen to make steel from iron ore instead of a traditionally uh, coal based blast furnace technology that is widely used uh, across the globe. We have been showing that this is possible to lower the CO2 emission per ton of steel produced from in the world average 2.2 ton carbon dioxide per ton steel produced down to around 25 kilo. So essentially we remove uh, completely the CO2 emission associated with the CO2 steel production from iron ore. And that has been shown it is possible. Next slide, please. And essentially what we have done is uh, to use hydrogen uh, as a chemical agent for reducing iron ore instead of using coal. And with this, we can eliminate the uh, uh, root cause of CO2 emission by, by producing steel for iron ore. And this has been shown is possible from mining operations to steel making and to making a, a heavy truck and also in uh, constructing buildings in our cities and the whole value chain can be decarbonized. Next slide, please. And we have uh, built this uh, facility, which is uh, a test facility and next step SSAB together with our partners, LKB and Button Fund, we are scaling this technology up to a commercial scale. And our aim is to start to deliver fossil free steel at commercial uh, conditions to our customers starting from 2026. And SSAB as a steel company today standing for 10% of Sweden's CO2 emission, 7% of Finland's CO2 emission. We are on the way to fully utilize this technology, replacing our current production uh, facilities. Uh, uh, and in the coming years, around 2030, we will uh, phase out all our uh, current production system uh, and replace it with this new technology. And with that, we will uh, decarbonize in principle all our operations across the globe. And that is uh, happening right now and hope uh, that this will also technology uh, be spread to the rest of the world. Next slide, please. We have shown that this is a possible, technically possible. Commercially, there is a market for this fossil free steel, and uh, we are now moving ahead, working together with our partners uh, uh, along the value chain. And that gives us uh, a hope for the steel industry uh, to uh, contribute for future development of uh, our societies without CO2 emissions. And I end there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can we have a big round of applause for Martin, everyone? Um, if you can uh, hear me too, then uh, I am curious if there are any questions in the room right now for Martin uh, with regards to the fossil-free steel production. Think about it for a little bit. If you do, you can step to the microphones here in the middle. But in the meantime, maybe I have a question, Martin. At the, you ended with together is key, right? That is one of the important things that we need in order to um, accelerate a little bit. When you talk with uh, sort of colleague steel uh, companies, what is the biggest bottleneck for them to, to engage in um, well, in fossil fuel free steel, is it is it the capacity of renewables to, uh, you know, wind energy, for example, to make to make the hydrogen, or what is the the biggest thing that's ongoing? Uh, yes, you are completely right. Uh, the most uh, difficult uh, question most people face is the availability of renewable electricity. Hmm. So that is really limiting the implementation of this technology. In addition to that, it's also to find the corporations that you need to work along the value chain because steel companies cannot solve this alone. We need the support from the mining industry, yeah. from the energy industry, but also from our customers that can support this transition. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, looking ahead, eh, do you, what sort of pro prospect do you expect? Do you expect this to, to take off really fast or are you a bit hesitant about how fast we can get to, uh, to an economy in which um, you know, steel-based production is headed towards fossil free? Uh, for the situation in Sweden and Finland, we are no, now moving very quickly, uh, implementing this technology because here we have a good starting point. We have uh, 
especially in Sweden, the electricity grid you see principal already today fully decarbonized, and we have customers that are prepared to pay a premium to support the transition. So for us, it's now just moving as quickly as we can. And in some other places in the world, there are a lot of interest in this new technology and what we have said in the hybrid uh, uh, case that this technology will be made available for others to uh, uh, utilize on a license basis. And hopefully that will help other yeah. parts of the world too. Yeah, does come back to the together is key. Thank you so much, Martin, for making the time here, for giving us a presentation. Uh, I think uh, it really helps to have such, an, uh, such a key industry example, I think, of, uh, of transitioning to a different one. Now, moving on to our next speaker, and I think the contrast in sort of skill, but also like uh, starting point can be an interesting one because our next speaker um, can tell us, can give us that startup sort of insight. His company works a lot on these topics as well. So um, I want to call to the stage the CEO of Eveco Constructions. Please give a big round of applause for Zahari Dolomanji. Stage is all yours. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, first of all, yeah, thank you for the gratitude. So the opportunity to speak on the Vienna International Climate and Energy Forum. Thanks to the Miss Mercedes that presented a lot of research information so I can focus on the story uh, and say about the things that are more practical based on the ground. And uh, would like to start about the the sharing the ideas, the startups, how can they help to make more sustainable construction area, make more sustainable future. And I think this is a perfect photo because you can see me and our product. We make prefabricated wall systems from pressed straw panels. And um, basically there is a global shift towards sustainability and it has impact on construction sector for sure. Uh, we can see it by introduction green building certification, like LED, so environment and energy uh, design, um, green building certifications, green building ratings. We can see it by in introducing or improving energy efficiency standards, because in the most countries we have established state bodies that can inform, evaluate, and control the process. Also, we can see that there are more, like there are specific sustainable development goals on uh, sustainable inter industrialization, sustainable cities, and sustainable production. We have introduced the circular economy principles, and most of the companies are starting to invest in R&D in this direction. And as a business representative, I want to mention the public awareness and uh, actually the eco-conscious consumer base. So I would say, I would like to say more about our uh, beginning. Because startups like ours that are trying to create new alternative materials for the construction sector, they face different challenges. And we, it's, it's totally normal. Like this is the picture of our first production line uh, without a good light, just one equipment, but we started slowly, slowly. So let's say we have a bright future. We have uh, idea, passion, and the vision. And there are at least four challenges for the startups in those darkness. First one is market skepticism, for sure. This starting from the price to the quality of the product. Uh, next one is state regulations, because legal uh, construction standards are not changing for decades. And even the certification bodies in our country, they are not enough equipped and not enough developed to test your product and certify it. Next one is financial inflexibility. From our experience, uh, the minor part of the financial institutions can propose at least a small credit line for the startups so they can start uh, doing something, trying, and improving their product. And um, lack of local ecosystems and supportive organizations. So the way from an idea to the minimum viable product was uh, pretty lonely. But anyway, uh, the startups, they have a lot of challenges, but it helps us to create some good solutions to find another way of growing. And uh, regarding the our solution, I would like to explain it in a very like, easy way. Um, we looked at our local raw materials in our country that are available. 
we are trying to um, research what did our ancestors, our previous generation, did with it. So maybe they tried to use it somehow. Then we look at the global market, what are the modern solutions? How are they still using this material? What do they do in this area of construction? And then step by step, you can try, you can improve that idea, you can improve the structure, you can improve the process, you can avoid some unnecessary activities in your production process, and you can do it until you will get more or less good product. Yeah. Um, and this product helps to make a lower carbon carbonization of the construction sector. And most of the startups are saying about two types of decarbonization. While you are producing and building, and the second one is while you are exploiting the, the building. But there is a third one, very important, is the end of life of the product, which means that how do you use your construction material after the building is like the, the, the cycle of the use of the building is done and what you can do with that material. And we are promoting the cradle to cradle approach, which means that we can safely return the raw material, return the product back to the environment. And the C2C approach gives us an opportunity to upcycle the product, which means that we are not only making uh, press straw panels that are sequestering a lot of CO2 for next 40, 50, 60 years being a building, but also you can make from this straw uh, after the end of the, cycle, of the life cycle, you can make better insulation materials, you can make textiles, you can make even package. So to make big changes, it's very hard to do it by yourself and you shouldn't do this. So as a startup, we are also uh, thinking about cooperation to create something like a supportive ecosystems in a cooperation between startups, as I said, between um, research institutions and state bodies. And to do this, we are proposing, because we have an opportunity to talk with the energy of, uh, with the Agency of Energy Efficiency in Moldova and uh, through the GCIP program, which is also part of this uh, local uh, ecosystem, we can propose some ideas about improving the policies on the local level, starting from construction codes that can be introduced something like a recommendation documents for the startups that they want to use natural materials or alternative materials. Then it would be nice to have um, additional advantages for the new alternative materials in tender procedures. And the third one would be nice to have uh, incentives or tax breaks or um, other kind of regulations that can help the new alternative uh, low carbon materials uh, fit the market and get the, the bigger covering. So, yeah, as I said before, and I will say it a lot of time, startups face challenges and it's uh, normal. And uh, this helps us to create new ideas, to find new solutions, to grow. And what is uh, part of the ecosystems, what is the duty of uh, us being here presented is to educate, to create professional communities with uh, free and easy access, to support uh, financially start of the pilot version of their products, to support them going to commercialize at the market, and um, bring them to the stage. Thank you. So much. Thank you, Sahari. Please do join me uh, to the front. Thank you for giving us that presentation. I love the slides, by the way, already before and I was going through and I was like, okay, I see something's happening here. Um, starting first off, after hearing this presentation about Sahari's startup, is there anybody in the audience that has a question for him? You are awfully shy today, I see. Um, not to worry, because I actually wanted to, you mentioned at the very end, I mean, startups, they, it's difficult and it's normal, so it's a normal thing. Um, so I feel like you've got the spirit to just, you know, usher on and go on. But I was wondering what, I mean, what can people here in the room and what can we sort of as a community do to better help you? Because this is not just a startup, it's also a startup that if you scale up and if you're successful, you're contributing to something that adds to the greater good, right? Yeah. So I think it's the, in the benefit of the mission of everyone here probably in this room to make sure that we have more of these initiatives. So how do we, how do we sort of enable that? 
Um, that's a good question. I would say that what we should do, like first of all, I'm here as a good example of doing, could you please re rephrase your, a little bit your question so I can yeah, say it better? Yeah, of course. What can we do to help startups, to help more startups to uh, scale up, basically? that focus on, for example, what you do with different sort of construction materials that we can use and different alternatives. Okay, so I got it ri right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, first of all, as I said, use the positive examples that have a uh, negative background. Hmm. Is a really nice way to motivate young people and uh, new startups. Also introduce, uh, as I mentioned before, some regulations on the local uh, legal level, like give a space and liberty to try something new give a directions to think on it. Yeah. Like there are these kind of materials that you can do. There are these kind of um, you know, examples of other countries. What do I, they do? Because good ideas are not coming from nothing. They're yeah. coming from the need mm -hmm. and they're coming from other person experience. Yeah. And you just combine it and you can create something new because uh, to create totally new from the nothing, it's almost impossible. And there right. is no need if there yeah. are solutions. So you just can combine them. So yeah, make the legal frame more open for the startups, uh, bring good solutions with the, bad, with the negative background to the stage, yeah. and uh, just uh, ask them what yeah. do they need, ask those startups, go to the rural area, because when you're from the small country, yeah. mostly there is a capital-based ecosystem. Mm. But out of the capital, there are a lot of good ideas, yeah. but unfortunately, lack of information. Yeah. So no, go to I the villages. Yeah, honestly, those are just for free, people. You get three tips from Zahari. I think those are good sorts of policies. It's showcase the good examples, uh, but also indeed go to the people themselves and ask them what they need. Can we have a big round of applause Thank once you. again for Zahari Dolomanji? Thank you so much for shedding light on that.